Hello, we are live at the ADA headquarters in beautiful, sunny, 70 degree weather in Chicago. I'm Dr. Sahil Mohideen, owner and general dentist of dentology here uh, in downtown Chicago. And in honor of National Children's Dental Health Month, I'm here today at the ADA headquarters to chat with Dr. Margarita Fontana, who is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. Go Blue. Go Blue, absolutely. <laughs> one of the expert panelists and contributors of the ADA evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the use of pit and fissure sealants. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Fontana. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is very exciting. It is, it is. Why don't we start with, you know, just a, a little background about yourself. You know, tell us a little bit about your career, um, how you got involved in the guidelines, and, and I'm sure everybody is curious to hear that. Oh, well, thank you. And um, of course, you are an alumni of our school, so it's, it's so great to see you again. Thank you very uh, much. So I'm a general dentist, and I uh, have a PhD in the area of karyology. Okay. Um, I got my degree overseas, okay. and I was very fortunate to come to the US, and I studied at Indiana University, okay. and I worked there for many years, and I joined the U of M faculty at 2009. And I, you know, I'm just delighted to have been able to participate in this sealant guideline development. Um, it's been a great learning experience and it's such an important tool for our clinicians yeah. in practice. And at, w at what time in your, uh, at the University of Michigan, wh where did you get involved in the guideline process and how, how did that, with the ADA, how did that come apart? So for this current guidelines, um, the process takes a long time. Okay. Uh, it's a, fa a fantastic group of team. This is a truly team effort. Okay. Um, the ADA staff and evidence-based dentistry is fantastic. And the experts that they brought together representing all the stakeholders that participate in use of, of sealants and recommendations for sealants, both in private and public uh, health settings. And so the process starts early on with identifying the questions that we think okay. have clinical relevance to okay. the patients and communities we are so privileged to serve, and then uh, abstracting all of that information, reviewing it in great detail, so that we can make truly decisions based on evidence or recommendations based on evidence. And it's really exciting to see that, and, and kind of our conversations before, you know, uh, we went live here, and you were saying that there was, uh, you know, some guidelines, but, you know, your your process, you know, we, you really looked in depth at all of the, the articles, and and the, the new 2016 guidelines are you know, a very specific uh, set of guidelines that us as clinicians um, you know, who you know, running a practice, you don't have a lot of time um, and, and to update you know, your, uh, your education. And it's nice to kind of have you know, some guidelines to follow and to train our staff and help, help our staff execute these, uh, these guidelines. Um, you know, Absolutely. Can you, you know, give us a little bit of a rundown on how the guidelines um, have changed or you know some of the things that some highlights of the clinical part of the guidelines. Absolutely. So, you know, sealants have been around for a long time. And we have had uh, in dentistry, both nationally and internationally, multiple guidelines throughout the different decades, all, su all supporting the use of sealants very okay. strongly for caries prevention and more recently for arrest of non cavitated lesions. I think the really nice part about this current guidelines is that the panel wanted to focus specifically on products currently available at the time that the guidelines were published last year okay. in the US market okay. that makes it really very clinically relevant to yep. those that are in practice that might not be so interested in old literature with UV polymerized sealants for okay. example that you don't have available but products that you can actually go and purchase categories of products that you can go and purchase and actually use in your practice tomorrow okay and yeah, tell hopefully us tonight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody you know, needs it. Probably somewhere there's something being sold, uh, you know, somewhere. And, and, and as far as products or you know things that you like to use or what you would recommend, what do you think is a good uh, product to use to do a sealant? Well, if you look at the results of the guidelines. Um, uh, from the systematic review, the very detailed and very um, detailed uh, review of the literature, um, the panel was not able to make a recommendation of one type of material category versus another. Okay. Um, the, the current evidence uh, was uh, very mixed, and both, just, just to be clear, all of the materials looked at were uh, supportive of a, a 
with strong effects on caries prevention and arrest of non-cavitated lesions. Uh, but the pa panel couldn't show a superiority of one product versus the other. So my recommendation to you is, based on that, that you should use a product, follow the manufacturer's uh, instructions uh, on how to use the product appropriately. Um, and then depending on the patient's circumstance, right? If you value retention and want to make sure that you have a material that is going to be there for a long period of time, then maybe a resin-based material would be a better choice. If you are going to use the material in a condition where there's more humidity and where the isolation might be a little bit more difficult, then you want a more hydrophilic material that can withstand those conditions. So you have to adapt the material choice to the patient's circumstance, of course. How do you, in your kind of everyday work, you know, you know creating these guidelines, how have you seen it at, you know, at the school at, at University of Michigan? How have you guys you know, now put that into practice? Yes, and um, you know, we at the University of Michigan, like many institutions nowadays, um, are very strong in evidence and applying evidence for the uh, benefit of our patients. And so uh, it's, it's, and it's a movement that is happening in healthcare in general, and medicine is the same thing. So we really want to make sure that we provide our students and future graduates, uh, like yourself, with the tools to be able to go into practice and know where to find the best available evidence and yep. to practice with that best available available evidence on behalf of their patients. And I think, you know, you're a busy practitioner. Yep. And you'll have to tell me how you transition from the busy uh, dental school years to a very successful practice. But I'm sure you're, you're very busy. You don't have time to read exactly. on every aspect of literature that you do in, pr in, the, in private practice, yep. right? Yep. And that's where I think organizations such as the ADA, dental schools, et cetera, have a responsibility to collect that information, summarize it, and present it to you in an easy way exactly. so that you can apply that information to your patient care. And because that's as a patient, right, exactly. what you and want. And I think the challenge that uh, as clinicians that, clinicians that we face is we just don't have a lot of time. Exactly. Right? And, and we don't have a lot of time to do research and have time to see what all the new guidelines are. Um, and then at the same time, how do we now implement that in, in, in our practice setting? Um, you know, something, so something like the, the ADA ceiling guidelines where, you know, the, you know looking at those forms, it's very spelled out really easily, you know. And you know what what I do in our practice, you know, we'll go over that between myself and the other doctors. You know, we read these through these guidelines and we have a discussion, you know, with our staff, you know, our hygienists, our, our assistants, you know, our providers, to say, you know, how do we create, you know, a uh, systematic approach, you know, to everything, you know, including sealants, right? So, you know, there, you know, obviously there's a lot of ways, like you were saying, to do a sealant properly and a lot of different material. Um, and what we've noticed in clinical practice, in actual, in our private practice, when you have one or only two ways or one way to do it, and it's really systematic, you are, you're going to get a great result every single time, right? Okay. And that's what we want to see. And because, you know, assistants are familiar with the material, hygienists are familiar with the material, doctors are familiar with certain materials, uh, it's good to get everybody on the same page, yeah. you know, and that's what we see. Um, in our in our practice here in Chicago. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and the beauty with sealants is that sealants is one of those caries management strategies where the literature is very consistent. Yeah. They work. They work really well, and they're very underutilized. Yep. So uh, guidelines are a way to provide to you a summary of the evidence okay. that a, a group has spent a lot of time looking at all the possible sources of bias and variation and consistency. And, 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 and it summarizes it to you in a really easy way to use. And if you look at those guidelines, we should all be using sealants. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and I, I have children, and my children have sealants, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I hope many other children in this country get access to sealants because they're a fantastic, uh, children and adolescents get a, yeah. access to sealants. That's a fantastic you said you had, you strategy. Have four, four kids. Four children. What are their ages? <laughs> they are 15, 17, 19, and 21. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're and probably thinking I'm very cool for being in Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they, you know, you said you've done sealants for, for all of them. You know. um, Absolutely. You know, I, I may have to take you up that, on that offer because I have a three-year-old, you know, and I still have trouble brushing her teeth. So, <laughs> you know, you may have to come in and do some sealants on her. 
uh, because but she doesn't listen to me. But again, <laughs> CELAs are part of the CARES management program, right? Yeah. So in, in private practice, when you see the patients that you see, yep. uh, th there's a number of things that you do to them. It wouldn't be just be CELAs, right? Uh, CELAs, but, but CELAs are, are extremely effective. Um, but we have to remember that in some settings, like public health settings, that might be the only alternative that yep. might be available for many communities. And there, um, like I said, the evidence is so strong yep. uh, and they're so underutilized that um, we should really try to facilitate uh, understanding of the guidelines and, and uh, adoption of the guidelines. And one thing that I found really interesting in, in, in you know, your article and, and, and the guidelines is that the sealants were much more were more protective from getting a, a cavity in the tooth versus even something like fluoride, right? Um, and that, you know, it, it w you know, as in clinical practice, we push fluoride, 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 and you know, we really want if we do sealants properly, we can really see a lot of cavity prevention that can sustain, you know, for a long period of time, you know, uh, into their adulthood. Um, you know, and tell me a little bit, um, you know, more about. Um, any other type of guideline creation or other expert panels that you've been with with the ADA? Um, has there any has there been any other involvement that you've had or um, uh, here? And we'd love to kind of hear about that. Yes. Well, uh, with the ADA, when the first sealant guidelines that were published back in 2008 came out. Um, I was a, a consultant for those guidelines. I had been very, very lucky to participate at the same time that ADA was developing those guidelines. Yep. The CDC was developing guidelines as well for sealant use in community-based programs. And, and, w and I was part of that panel. Okay. And that's okay. probably my first experience in participating in systematic review okay. and a guideline development. Okay. Uh, since then, I, I have been lucky. I mean, uh, the ADA is working on some very uh, interesting caries management yeah. guidelines. And I'm going to be part of that group. Okay. Uh, the AAPD is also working on some silver diamine fluoride guidelines, and I'm very lucky to be part of that group. So it's a, you know, it's such a fantastic learning opportunity to be part of this panels. So you are with uh, brilliant colleagues yep. that you can yep. learn from. Uh, the methodology that we are not experts in uh, is just fascinating to see the rigor and the excellent science that leads to development of these guidelines. Um, so you know, I know we're kind of reaching, you know, the end. Uh, so I definitely want to get some more uh, kind of fun facts, you know, <laughs> uh, about you or, um, you know, and I can tell you a couple of fun things, you know. And Please tell me. <laughs> um, so, so how did you transition from your busy dental school years to being such a successful owner? And how, how do you feel fun into that? And I think the, you know, I, I think the, the main thing, you know, obviously I grew up, in Michigan, and you know, I did my undergrad in dental school at University of Michigan, and and, and you know that transition from school to a um, you know to practicing dentistry is difficult because you're 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 now going from an environment that you feel very protected, you know, to an environment that you're on your own, um, and you never have all of the answers. And uh, it's important to you know do what you love in dentistry and find that and and. Uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, for myself and my partners, we created an experience of going to the dentist that was really hip and really fun and modern um, and really customer service driven. Um, and I think that was the part that really made that process really exciting for us. Um, and we're all big time Michigan fans. <laughs> I know there's a lot of <laughs> U of M Go people <laughs> tuning in here. Absolutely. You know, we, you, know, you know, we'll wrap up. I'll tell you a really small story. Uh, about a patient of mine, big time Ohio State fan. I mean, like <laughs> huge, big <I> mean, rivalry. <laughs> you know, every time he comes in, you know, he trash talks to me, wears Ohio State shirts. He brought me a shirt the other day, and you know, I did a, I did a crown preparation on him, uh, and you know, and we left him with a temporary. And when he uh, when he went and when he was gone for two weeks, and we were going to put the permanent crown on, I had a patient of mine that came in that had a crown with a Michigan M on it. Oh my gosh. And I was like, this is a, it was like the best day of my life, you know. Uh, and, and I took a picture of it. And I, you know, when, when like Mike, my patient, when he, when he came in, you know, I, we cemented his crown. You know, I told my sisters, don't show him the crown. It looked good. The shade was perfect. Uh, but I said, hey, you know, Mike, why don't I show you your crown? So I popped up that picture of the, of the crown with the Michigan symbol on it. And he was like, <gasps> Oh my God, he was he was really appalled, but I had to tell him that yeah. you know <laughs> it, it's it's not real. So um, you know we take that Michigan Ohio State rivalry pretty. <laughs> 
pretty <laughs> pretty heavy, you know. So, uh, but so it's excited to it's exciting to see you again, you know. Absolutely. You know, seven years after. Absolutely. You know, the last time we saw what a pleasure! Other, you know, I hope you are a fan of sealants. I'm a huge fan of sealants. You know, I still have ceilings, actually. Fantastic. You know, so, Absolutely. Um, and, and I appreciate you coming on and, and, and talking to us. And you know, uh, we're excited to kind of see how this guideline helps everyone uh, in clinical practice. And um, and you know, hopefully, see more of these uh, live events here. Absolutely. Yeah, so. If this change uh, yeah. anyone's mind, even if it's one person, it's worthwhile because uh, the the health of the communities that we have the privilege to serve yep. could be so much enhanced by using evidence-based approaches yep. to, to management of their diseases. And so it's really, it was very nice to talk to you and very nice to see your excitement yeah, with uh, evidence you. and I'm with guidelines. Yeah, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. It, it